You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We are continuing our history series in the English Reformation with Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Last time we left off at with William Tyndale, and so what would you like to revisit about Tyndale as we continue our conversation today, Dr. McKenzie? Sure. I, I just want to point out that Tyndale had a great deal of influence upon the English Bible subsequent to himself. Later translations, including maybe especially the King James Version, which most of your listeners have heard of, incorporated Tyndale's work into that translation so that if you grew up with the King James Version the way I did, 90% of what you learned in the New Testament was actually Tyndale's language, Tyndale's translation. And likewise, in the parts of the Old Testament that he did, you again, King James incorporated just tons of Tyndale. But the King James Version was in turn the basis for some of our modern translations, like the Revised Standard Version, again, that a lot of people in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod grew up with, and then today's English Standard Version, which is a revision of the Revised Standard Version. So even today in our churches, lots of what Tyndale originally wrote as translations of the New Testament still survives in these modern translations. So it's, it's worth knowing about William Tyndale, if for no other reason, that he's kind of the source and background to the English Bible, as so many of us have learned to know and to... Talking about these people who are translating the Bible into into the common language of the people, why was it so dangerous for these people to be doing this work? Because I know, I mean, this happened in Germany, it happened in England, it happened in France. What was what was that that danger for these people to be to be doing this work oh you know that really is a good question we need to understand that in the this period of time the 16th century religion just as a whole was really much more important to people at all levels and in all institutions than it is for us today. We're kind of comfortable with the notion that we can live side by side with people who don't share the same faith that we do. We figure that out. Uh, maybe we don't like everything that our society does at the government and social level, but nonetheless, we appreciate very much religious liberty. They hadn't figured that out in the 16th century. The changing religion was a threat to the unity of society. It was a threat to the way the society was organized and structured. And so it was, it was dealt with very, very harshly. And again, there's maybe a kind of justification for it. If you, if you think that if you hold the wrong faith or you're teaching heresy, you're actually sending people to hell. And of course, that's a horrible thing to do. And so they really reacted against uh, what they considered false doctrine or heresy in a kind of fierce and consuming way. And the way they wanted to do it, the traditional way to do it was somebody who was a heretic and wouldn't recant. He's going to be burned at the stake. His ashes are going to be put into moving water, a river or something like that. Nobody is going to be able to make a martyr, or make a, a saint out of that person. There won't be any relics all of his influence will be removed, removed at least as much as humanly was possible. And that was to safeguard the community, the traditional way of doing things. So it, it was just a, a very serious thing and treated really seriously and seriously. You know, they had death penalties for a lot of stuff, but heresy was definitely one of those. And this wasn't a new thing in this generation or in this century. I mean, I, as we've been learning in this series about some of the martyrs of this Reformation, every time you mention one, it always makes me think of Jan Hus, which well, yeah. was about 100 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Now, I, it, I would say that there's a lot more of them in this period, but, mm -hmm. but it is true that Hus is one of the kind of the great medieval martyrs for his faith. Sometimes the one who's thought of as kind of the last one of the Middle Ages is Savonarola who was kind of the prophet of the last times in Florence, right right at the end of the 15th century. He too was, well, I guess he was hanged and then his body was burned, but uh, he was also martyred as a late medieval reformer. 
Hmm. So we've learned about martyrs of this Reformation and, and earlier the Proto-Reformation, if you will. Um, what else was happening at the time of this Reformation? Let's take a look at not just the theologians, but other aspects of what was happening in this Reformation. Sure. I think it's time for us to bring into our narrative Henry VIII. We've suggested that he's a part of the story before. Now let's make him a part of the story. Henry uh, became king of England in 1509. So he'd been on the throne for several years by the time Luther came along. And then in the 1520s, he was well established as monarch when Luther's writings and so forth started to make their way into England. Now, Henry th always thought of himself as a kind of a proponent of the new learning, the Erasmus type kind of stuff. But he had no use, at, I, no use at all for the new religion. And when Luther wrote his very famous treatise on the medieval sacramental system, the Babylonian captivity of the church, it was published in 1520, in which he went through each of those ostensible seven sacraments and tested them on the basis of the Bible and showed how on the basis of the Bible, we didn't have seven, we had only two plus confession and absolution and that the important things and the ones that we had was God's promise of forgiveness, Henry couldn't take it. So Henry himself authored a response to Luther's Babylonian captivity, a defense of the seven sacraments. And the Pope was so thrilled to have a monarch of Europe right in defense of traditional sacramental beliefs that he named Henry Defender of the Faith. Now, maybe you've, maybe you've heard that sometimes as a title that the monarchs of England have. You know, when they list the, the titles, they go on forever, you know, by the grace of God, King of, King of Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, you know, they have this big long list. And at the end of the list, there is Defender of the Faith. Well, that was a title first bestowed upon Henry VIII for his defense of the Catholic faith. And the irony, of course, is, is that Henry and virtually all of his successors, with a couple of notable, notable exceptions, bear that same title, even though they're no longer defending the Catholic faith, they are at least nominally defending the Protestant faith. So it's one of the kind of interesting ironies of, of history. So Henry VIII, defender of the faith, traditional religion, doesn't want heresy. And that's why during those first years of the Reformation of the 1520s, you got into trouble. If you were a Thomas Bilney or a Hugh Latimer or a Robert Barnes, you got into trouble for heresy. However, this starts to change in the late 1520s when Henry VIII decides that he wants a divorce from his wife, Queen Catherine. Now, lots of folks are kind of familiar with the fact that Henry went through a lot of wives, and maybe they know that the Reformation had something to do with his quest for a divorce. But that wasn't Luther, that wasn't Henry's original thinking. He wanted a divorce mostly for dynastic reasons. So let me talk about that for a little while. Why would Henry want a divorce? He had married Catherine in 1509. And by the time that he starts trying to get a divorce, it's 1527, that's 18 years later. And as far as royal marriages go, uh, this had been a pretty good royal marriage. Catherine had actually helped him significantly at the beginning by kind of running England when he was off on the continent fighting a war against France. She had borne him six children. She herself was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. You know about them from Christopher Columbus fame. Well, she's their daughter. And her nephew was the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. So, you know, as far as royal marriages go, it was a pretty good one. But there were some problems. Now, Hollywood has made a lot out of the romance between Henry and another woman, Anne Boleyn, a lady in waiting to Queen Catherine. And certainly there was an Anne Boleyn, and Henry would like to have made her queen. But that was not the real issue. The real issue was that of the children, and they say there were at least six of them, the children that Catherine 
had, uh, or that Henry had conceived by Catherine, only one of them had survived infancy. It was, a, but the other five or more had died either stillborn or just shortly after birth. And at least a couple of those children had been sons. Now, we're at a time in English history, at any rate, and most other places as well, where it was kings that you wanted on the throne to establish a strong dynasty, not female rulers, not queens. England had had only one experience with a female ruler. It was way back in the 12th century. Henry I had died, and his only child was a daughter, Queen Matilda, Queen Maud. And she no sooner tried to claim the throne than there was a civil war. Her cousin, a male, insisted on it. And so it was just a very terrible period. So England's only experience with a female ruler had been a disaster. Moreover, Henry's family, the Tudor family, had only been ruling England for a short time. They had succeeded to the throne after the War of the Roses, which was like a civil war between branches of the royal family. And if, they, if Henry would leave behind a weak candidate for the throne, like a female ruler, perhaps that civil war, the War of the Roses, would break out again. So there's a lot of concern by Henry and his advisors that he needed to have a strong male as his heir to the throne. And Catherine hadn't given him one, and she wasn't going to give him one. Now, today, if this kind of situation arose, I'm sure that the couple would be going to see a doctor and they would be investigating what was wrong. But in Henry's case, he thought that it was God who was punishing him. God was punishing him for a sin. Now, I'm looking at the time here, and I think we're scheduled for a break. So, maybe, yeah, let's. Yeah, I should stop. Yeah, let's take a quick break, but I know we're right in the middle of the story. We will pick it up on the other side of the break. I know we're like, oh, right on the edge of the seat. Okay. okay. <laughs> we will be right back. We're talking with Dr. Cameron McKenzie from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana on the English Reformation. More to talk about. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others. To live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world. To live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. We are talking with Dr. Cameron McKenzie, a professor of historical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, about the English Reformation. And we are right in the middle of King Henry VIII's story, talking about why he would have wanted a divorce and and what, what he was pursuing. So, all right, let's pick the story back up. Yeah, here we go. All right. So as I said, he, he can't consult doctors about why his wife can't bring a baby to full term or what's going on there. So he has to look elsewhere. And he understands that things happen in one's life under the providence of God. So if he doesn't have a son by Catherine, it must be because God is angry at him. But why would God be angry at poor Henry? You might say, well, maybe God's angry at you, Henry, because you haven't been faithful to your wife and you have all kinds of mistresses. Well, he didn't draw that conclusion. And one of the reasons he didn't draw that conclusion was because by one of his mistresses, he actually had a son, a son whom he recognized, a son who grew up, a son who did not die at childbirth. So Henry kind of puts that aside and thinks, no, it's got to be something else. Well, what's the something else? Well, the something else was the fact that Henry had married the widow of his older brother, Arthur. In other words, Henry had married his sister-in-law. And there was an Old Testament Bible passage 
which seemed to say that that was wrong. It was from Leviticus 20, and it said something to the effect that if you married your sister-in-law, you would be childless. Here's the, here's the quotation. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. They shall be childless. Well, he wasn't exactly childless, but from his dynastic perspective, he might as well have been childless. And so he came to the conclusion that it was a sin to marry your sister-in-law. And since that was a sin, God was showing him it was a sin by keeping him from having a son. So Henry's concerned about the dynasty. Henry's concerned about Anne Boleyn. And Henry's concerned about his own soul. He wants a divorce. There was something that probably had been niggling Henry for a long time. It was actually against church law to marry your sister-in-law. It was a violation of church law. But when the two fathers, Henry VII and Ferdinand of Aragon, had worked out a political peace deal by having a son marry a daughter, in the case of England, the Prince of Wales, Arthur, Mary Catherine of Aragon, and Arthur died, the fathers didn't want that deal to fall apart. So they got a dispensation from the church law from the Pope. Pope Julius II said, I dispense from that law. You don't have to obey it. The two can get married. So now Henry has, many years later, Henry has this problem of the, all the little boys dying. And so he comes to the conclusion that this is wrong and that the Pope had no power to make that ruling. And therefore, he goes to the Pope at the time, this now is Clement VII, and wants him to basically say that the previous Pope was wrong and that Henry never really had been properly married to Catherine. And so to get a divorce, or better what we would call in today's language, to get an annulment, a ruling from the Pope that his first marriage was never a real marriage because it had broken this law against marrying your sister-in-law. So that brings the Pope into the picture. So Henry's right-hand man, we mentioned him on an earlier occasion. This is Cardinal Wolsey. He's do doing Henry's business and had been doing it for years. Sends emissaries to the Pope in order to get, that, get this marriage annulled. Well, the Pope's not going to do this. The Pope, this is a, a politically charged move to grant an annulment when the wife is the aunt of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. It's never going to happen. But now Clement is a, a diplomat, so he doesn't say, no, I can't do this. He delays, he delays, and delays. And finally, Henry and Wolsey think that they have persuaded him because the Pope finally agrees to appoint a judicial commission with the Pope's power to hear the case in England. And Henry and Wolsey are really glad about that because they get this case in England, then they'll have some direct influence on the outcome. And in fact, the Pope actually appoints Henry, or not Henry, Wolsey to be one of his, one, one of the adjudicators. He also names an Italian by the name of Campeggio, who had represented English interests at the court to be the other adjudicator. So we've got this special commission consisting of two men both of whom the English are confident will rule in their favor. So they set up a adjudication procedure in England, and I think it's in 1529. And the case opens, and a couple of things happen that make Henry look bad. One is there are two different forms of the dispensation. They don't quite agree. There's a Spanish form and there's an English form. Okay. And then in open hearing, Queen Catherine comes and she kneels before Henry, and she says to Henry, you know that I was a virgin when we were married. You know that. And of course, Henry would be the only one who would know that. And basically, what she's saying is, I was never really married to your brother. He died a couple of years, a couple of months after our marriage. The marriage was never consummated, was never really married so that this marriage is your first marriage and it is valid. Well, 
this puts the king into a very embarrassing light, but he still is hopeful that the adjudication will go in his favor. But what he didn't know was that the Pope had told the Italian cardinal not to give a final sentence. And that turned out to be the case when the cardinal kind of surprisingly said, oh, we have to adjourn this trial because these are the holiday seasons or the vacation seasons in Italy. And we're going to observe the same vacation time as the Italians do. Well, that was the signal that this wasn't going to happen. The cardinal finally goes back to Italy. This was the signal for Henry VIII to get rid of Wolsey. He falls from power. And now Henry has to start thinking of another way that he can get this divorce because he's not going to get it from the Pope. So what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Well, what he ends up doing, and it takes him a while to get there, is to take the steps whereby the church in England, not the church going all the way to the Rome, but the, just the church in England, will have final jurisdiction over this matter. And how is he going to accomplish that? Well, he decides, and again, he's got advisors who are suggesting this to him, that he ought to summon a parliament. And he ought to use the parliament, first of all, to put pressure on the Pope. And then subsequently, we'll see that it's the, through the parliament that the king ends up breaking with the Pope. Now, I want to say a little word or two here about parliament, because otherwise it's going to be totally misleading. Parliament was not then what it is today. Parliament only met when the king summoned it to meet. It only dealt with the agenda that the king gave it to deal with. And when the parliament had done the business that the king wanted it to do, he sent the parliament home. So most of the time, parliament was not in session. It was not the instrument of government the way it is in England today. It was rather an occasional institution called by the king, usually when the king needed more money than the regular taxes were bringing in. That was its usual purpose or function. War breaks out, we need more money, we need parliament. But in this particular instance, it's very significant that Henry decided to use parliament to make this break with Rome because that really increased the uh, prestige of the institution of parliament helped it was a giant step in making parliament into the kind of legislative body that it is today. Well, anyway, 1529, he summons a parliament. And the first thing this parliament is going to do is enact financial measures to pressure the Pope. Those things don't work. And finally, in 1532, Henry asked the parliament to create the English ecclesiastical legal system from the Roman ecclesiastical legal system. In other words, decisions by church courts in England will, can no longer be appealed to the Pope. And in this legislation, it's called an Act in Restraint of Appeals, Henry makes the argument that England is itself sovereign and that the English people have only one sovereign, that's the king, and it's true whether the people are thought of as English subjects of the crown or whether they are thought of as members of the church in England. In both cases, they have but one sovereign, and that is the King of England. And so that becomes like kind of the major step, the first major step in the separation of the church in England from the Pope. Within the next couple of years, they also pass an act of supremacy. And this makes the King of England the supreme head of the church in England. So from the divorce, we get to the separation of the Church of England from Rome. One, I need a visual timeline <laughs> to compare this because th this was what, in the 1520s, late mm -hmm. 1520s? 1520s so, it starts, right. So th th when you think about what had just been going on with Luther, Mm-hmm. Boy, those popes had to be busy around this time in, <laughs> in history. And what, what history with Henry VIII, like Hollywood couldn't write this better. No. This is so interesting. It really is. Also yeah. terrible. Yeah. But 
So interesting. So interesting. A great history series with Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, professor of historical theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is a great series. Okay, so today we got into Henry VIII. What are we going to look at next time, Dr. McKenzie? Well, we'll talk about whether Henry VIII actually ever did anything besides break with the Pope. And then we'll look forward to what his son or what happened under his son, Edward VI, when you really get a real Protestant Reformation. Very good. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.